what's called the now endocannabidone. So it's the entire new world, newly discovered world of lipid signaling agents. And they build off of omega-6 and omega-3. And we absolutely must have them in order for our bodies to function properly. We used to always focus on peptides. And now we realize that, of course, they're very important. But we also have lipid mediators. So I would say eat real food, get rid of all the processed food, all the junk food, all the chemicals in food, and eat real food. Dr. Felice Gers, welcome to the Keto Camp Podcast. Well, I'm so happy to join you here today. I'm excited. I've been studying you a lot lately, and you are a trailblazer. I, I love the work that you're doing, and your story is amazing. And before we get into all the cool things that you're doing right now, <laughs> how did you get into this? Share your story with my audience. Well, somehow I knew there was always more to helping people to obtain up health and just giving prescription medications or doing surgery. So very early on in my career, I, I started my own medical practice and I incorporated what I called my ancillaries. I had a Chinese medicine practitioner, I had a nutritionist, a psychologist, massage therapist, biofeedback, but I myself had no specific training beyond the standard, you know, conventional training as an OBGYN. Then about a dozen years ago now, I can't believe how much time has passed it was my time to stop doing obstetrics. After delivering thousands of babies and being up countless numbers of nights for years and years, for decades, it was time to just, that was it, I had to stop. And probably I had more sleep, I had more time. I started thinking about the therapeutic tools that I had left in my toolbox to help my women patients. And it seemed pretty skimpy. I looked and I said, what do I do? I do surgery, and, but that's really for end stage disease. Why can't they be more proactive? So often in the OBGYN world, because I'm a board certified OBGYN doctor, and now also board certified in integrative medicine, but what we would tell patients like, well, it's not that bad, we'll just watch it. And if it gets really bad, we'll do surgery. It's like, what kind of an approach is that? We watch it, and when it gets really bad, we cut things out. So I really felt lost. I, I felt like I didn't really know what to do to really help my women patients. So I went on my own little personal journey. I started taking classes everywhere that I could find something that seemed relevant, but I had no real organization. And I ended up taking a lot of classes with naturopathic doctors. And I didn't even know who they were, but I loved their philosophy, which was, the doctor as sort of the teacher or the pathfinder to help each patient really harness their own innate mechanisms to heal themselves. And that just resonated with me. And I was at one of those meetings and there was one of the lecturers was a woman doctor named Dr. Lodog. And she and I were the only two medical doctors. Everybody else was a naturopathic doctor in the room. During the break, I went up to her and I said, Dr. Lodog, you and I are the only MDs in this entire room and I am so lost. I don't really have a plan. I don't know what I'm doing. She said, the fellowship in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona School of Medicine, and she was the director, it starts in two weeks. After talking to you, I know you're qualified. Why don't you apply and come? So I went home, I was in Portland, I flew home, that was a Sunday night, I did the application, and two weeks later I was in Tucson, Arizona, and I did the two-year fellowship, which I completed in 2012, and I have never looked back, only forward, and I've then um, gone on to take many functional medicine classes and done a lot of research on my own, and I consider myself a synthesizer. So I research across every type of scientific area, whether it's veterinary medicine, environmental science, any form of medicine, any organ system, what doesn't matter what the specialty is. And then I look at all the basic science and the clinical data, and then I try to put it all together to really create programs and a philosophy and an understanding, a deep understanding of how women's bodies work so that as a practicing clinician, because that's really what I do most of my time is taking care of my patients in my office where we are right now in one of my exam rooms <laughs> on my lunch break, I take care of patients and I have a, a philosophy that has really incorporated all of my research and my training to really help every one of my patients to optimize their health so that they can have the kind of lives that they deserve to have. Beautiful. You know, I always quote Albert Einstein. He, he said, um, intellectuals solve problems, geniuses prevent them. 
you are a genius. Like you well. were somebody who was <laughs> at the end stage and doing surgeries and treating conditions. And you realize that you want to be at the forefront of this and not even let it get to that point. And uh, Absolutely. a lot of doctors, they, some of them, I should say, come to that realization, but they don't take action to make that switch because you, ch you took massive action to start integrating these, these other components into your practice. How difficult was that? Did you get a lot of heat from the conventional approach? Like, what was that uh -huh. like going through it? It still is. It still is. I had a patient just a month ago who was um, put on uh, PPIs, proton pump inhibitors. So those are drugs that block the production of stomach acid, which is very key to digestion. We have a reason why we make stomach acid. But she went to a gastroenterologist and that's sort of their, their go-to for just about everything. You know, I have, I have heartburn, I have indigestion. Well, just go on this drug. And so she was put on it like a dozen years ago. <laughs> it was so long ago. And no one ever took her off of it. And I, ha I needed her to have an endoscopy, a look with a scope down into her stomach just to make sure she didn't have an ulcer or have stomach cancer, because I, I didn't really know what was going on there all these years. And she was a little bit older. So I said, first get that worked up. And then I know how to wean you off of this drug because it's really harmful. It increases your risk of cardiovascular events. It's just terrible. You can't absorb and digest food properly when you don't have stomach acid. So she went to a gastroenterologist who said, this stuff is good for you. And like, why, who is she anyway? You know what? She's a gynecologist. She, what does she know about this? Why don't you go to a real doctor? I know. And so my patient jumped in and defended me and said, excuse me, my doctor is a real doctor. She is double board certified. She speaks and lectures all around the world at conferences and she is a real doctor, but that's still happening. It's like, you know, the idea of trying to change is really, um, you know, it's, it's like hateful to a lot of doctors. I hate to say it. They're so set in their ways and they're so brainwashed by big pharma that they just don't want to see that there are other approaches to trying to be healthy, you know, to try to help their patients than putting them on drugs that have many of them black box warnings. So it's not like we don't know, you know, these are not secrets that um, these drugs have harmful side effects and that they're not addressing the underlying causes. And that's one of the things about big pharma. I, was a very pro big pharma person at one point in my life because I lived and worked through what I call the heyday of big pharma when it seemed like a new blockbuster drug came on the market every month and the drug reps were flooding my office with coke and food and pens and cups and you know travel tote bags I mean it's like unbelievable the like stuff <laughs> that was just flooding my office food and stuff and samples drug samples and and I really believe that these drugs are really like wonder drugs. And I just totally changed my view of everything. It's like, um, I also lived not only through the introduction of all these drugs, but often the retraction of all these drugs. So when they got taken off the market. I, I was a big fan of Vioxx, which is a, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, an NSAID. And I was using it for all my patients that had menstrual cramps and post-operative pain and everything. And then they took it off the market with the explanation that it increased the risk of heart attacks and death, you know, by a significant amount. And that many people like 50 something thousand, I, I think was the number had died, you know, that, that shouldn't have died because they had been prescribed this drug. And then there were many, many other drugs that were, that came, they went. And then I saw all the surgical tools that were designed for OBGYNs. And I used them all and, and they had problems like the Morsolator, the Eshore, or, which was taken off the market by Bayer recently. So there was the Eshore, the Morsolator, the, all the meshes that were implanted for a prolapse and all these different tools that didn't really work well, that, you know, clips that didn't really create good hemostasis and they would, could be bleeding. So I saw so many problems with the medical devices and the big pharma. And so, but a lot of doctors just don't, don't see it. So I see that they can also be life-saving. So it's not like that's not part of my therapeutic toolbox. I just don't jump to them right out at the gates. You know, I look for ways that you can, like I said, harness your own innate healing mechanisms, which almost always have to do with lifestyle choices, right? I, which I, I, it's yeah. uh, like, so lifestyle medicine 
which is actually a sort of a sort of like a specialty of medicine. That should be medicine. What do you mean that's a subspecialty? And it's like, you know, it's like you can either turn right or left when you go into the medical building, either right, you get a pharmaceutical and a surgical procedure, or you turn left and you get a lifestyle education. So it's, it should all be, it's a continuum, right? We start with lifestyle and then we move into the more, um, you know, potentially dangerous drugs, surgicals when we have to. But um, so I haven't abandoned modern science or, or drugs or surgery, not at all. I just put them in their place and I try to do other things first because, you know, the whole process is to find the safest and most efficacious approach to helping people to optimize their health. I love it. Uh, and I heard you talk about um, one of those medications that you were prescribing and you started reading the studies was uh, for an overactive bladder. And uh, mm -hmm. the, the benefit of it, I believe you said, was going to the bathroom just one less time oh, per day. No, that was what happened was, um, so you're bringing back all my memories, like a flood of memories. So I demanded for the first time in my career that these pharmaceutical reps who really flooded my office, that they actually show me the original studies that were used to get their drug approved by the FDA. I had never made them do that. And so one of the, the pharmaceutical reps came in with the data for one of the drugs for overactive bladder. And when I looked at it, I, they just, you know, they, they kind of crunch the numbers and play with the data. But when you actually looked at it over 24 hours, the benefit was one less trip to the bathroom to urinate. And it's like, and this drug had potential side effects of constipation and cognitive decline. And it's like, wait a minute, you know, this doesn't make sense. So you go to the bathroom one less time. You know, I don't think the, the you know, I always look at everything in risk benefit ratio. I don't mm -hmm. think it quite meets the test. So that was like a real aha moment for me. And then I, as I looked for every, the, you know, the data on every single pharmaceutical, it was really surprising how sometimes the difference between the placebo and the drug wasn't very dramatic. And some of them, like the weight loss drugs, the ones for weight loss, they would go down and the patient would lose weight and then it would come back up and it was like halfway back up the curve of if it's a, like a U, it was coming up the U and then they stopped the study. when So it was halfway up, so going back up the U. And it's like, well, maybe if the study had continued for another three months, it would be right back where it started from, you know? So uh, there's something wrong here. They lose weight and then they're back gaining weight, but then the study ends and it says, wow, look, they lost 3% of their weight. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. They were on the upswing at that point. So um, I try to be very... Um, evidence-based in everything I do. It really has to be um, you know, shown that it makes sense scientifically. Now, sometimes we don't have enough drug studies or um, lifestyle studies or any kind of study involving females. Because as you may know, up until 2015, the National Institutes of Health did not require that women be in any studies. And so they weren't. They hardly ever were in studies, except if it was specifically a female issue. And so, because why would they include women when they didn't have to? Women could get pregnant, women could go through menopause, women could go on or off hormones. Women were more complex. So they didn't use women in studies. So almost all the data we have about most of the pharmaceuticals that are used, and not just pharmaceuticals, you know, procedures like um, catheterizations of coronary arteries and such. The data was all gathered by using men as study subjects. Now, since then, you have to designate women, include women, but um, it's still very difficult to get a lot of data. We have more, but it's only been in the last few years that women have really been included in any studies. And so we really have a, um, we have to sometimes make a lot of extrapolations from data that may not really be applicable to women. Yeah, it's a good point. It's crazy that this, just recently they allowed to, women to do these studies. Yeah. Um, what you were sharing, I want to go back real quick about how a lot of conventional doctors and conventional treatment, they're in a box, uh, this medical box. And uh, I think part of its system, part of it is a lot of these doctors, they're just um, becoming ignorant in terms of they're, they're just looking away from, from things they know that are true. And it reminds me of have you ever seen or heard about the docu-series Chernobyl based off of what happened over there in Chernobyl? I have heard of it, but I haven't seen it. It's, it's so good. So I was watching it actually last night with my girlfriend. And the reason I thought about it, it's because 
when it all started to happen in Chernobyl, one of the commanders, there was an explosion at the facility and he was in such denial that the core exploded. And um, the reason he was denying it is because if it was true, millions and mi millions of people would, would be dead. So he would deny it at all costs and he would send people to go explore it and those people would end up dying and, and it, we know how it turned out. So the, I, I thought about what was happening there and I see what's happening in this world where a lot of doctors, if they, are, if they admit that they're wrong, that means a lot of people have gotten hurt based off of the suggestions they have done or a lot of things, you know, and, yeah. and it's like, you can't go back. It's so it's very you, hard. Yeah. Well, that's how I feel a lot about the Women's Health Initiative. When that study, which was a huge study with thousands of women, and it was ended abruptly after just around five years out into the study back around 2002. And the conclusions were very hostile to the use of hormones for women. And they, were, they did write in the study that they, they were talking about the formulation that they used in the study, but that isn't how it ended up being distributed in terms of education and information. It was really, they used the word hormone for the chemicals that they used, which were never ever found in a human female body at any point in life. And they then extrapolated it to include bioidentical hormones, which is a very, very incorrect kind of a, a scientific leap. And that would be like you did a study and you utilized strawberry flavored jelly beans. And then you found, hey, you know, these strawberry flavored jelly beans increase the risk of obesity and cavities and diabetes. So the conclusion of this study is never eat an organic strawberry. And it's like, well, that isn't really what you studied, but that's what they did with this women's health initiative. They used a, an equine conjugated estrogen. That means it's what the horse doesn't want. The pregnant horse has already taken that estrogen and put it through its own liver and conjugated it and including a lot of other extraneous stuff and, and hormones. It goes out into the urine and then they just um, made it into a powder and then into a tablet. And that was what was called estrogen. And it really wasn't even what the horse wanted. And it was certainly never something that would be in a human female. And then they used medroxyprogesterone acetate, which is a chemical that is called a progestin, which is just a made up word for a chemical that's an endocrine disruptor that can bind to progesterone receptors, but it, it's what we call an agonist slash antagonist. So it can either act like a substitute or a blocker for progesterone, depending on the site. And it also works on other hormone receptors as well. It's not strictly for progesterone, but it's not progesterone. It's a chemical endocrine disruptor. It's officially an endocrine disruptor. It would be like, I want my dose of estrogen today, so I'm going to lick a hot plastic bottle. I mean, that's not estrogen. That's an endocrine disruptor for estrogen. And medroxyprogesterone acetate is not progesterone. It's an endocrine disruptor, and they just make them into pharmaceuticals. Oh, that's just what they did. And there were other pharmaceuticals that were endocrine disruptors, for example, DES, diethylstilbestrol, which was used way back like in the 1970s or earlier to try to prevent miscarriages, which of course it did not do, but it was an endocrine disruptor and it caused tremendous harm both in the woman who took it and in her offspring. Like in the young girls who were born who were exposed in utero, they had um, a very significant risk of a very rare cancer called adenocarcinoma of the vagina, which could kill them. And all of this was using an endocrine disruptor, which of course was then taken off the market. Well, medroxyprogesterone acetate is an endocrine disruptor for progesterone. It acts weirdly on progesterone receptors. And it turns out that it's harmful. And by giving this combination, which was all they had when they started designing this research um, study, um, they made some tremendously erroneous and harmful conclusions, which um, are still rippling through women's healthcare today. And a lot of doctors are still believing that hormones harm women in a whole myriad of ways when hormones are the essence of life itself. And all they are are messenger. They keep saying, what is a hormone? It's a delivery system for information to the cell. It's not evil. You just have to have the right amount at the right time so you get the right response. You know, it's like, you know, on a cellular level, it's incredibly complex. But when you think of it in just overall terms, it's really just a way of providing information. 
And if you have the wrong information because you have an endocrine disruptor replacing the real hormone, or you have the wrong amount or at the wrong time, of course, you're going to get the wrong response. And that's what the Women's Health Initiative really showed. If you give the wrong thing in the wrong dose, you're going to get, uh, you're not going to get the, the ultimate out, you know, outcome you hope for. And so it's time to leave that in the dust and say it's of historical interest only and to move forward and let women really um, regain faith and confidence in their own hormones <laughs> instead of fearing their own hormones. Like, I mean, the idea that estrogen in a woman is evil is, um, is really shocking. What's evil are endocrine disruptors, <clears throat> you know, um, food that's masquerading as food. Well, it's not really food. It's not, it doesn't even qualify. I had to go to dictionary.com to, because I would travel a lot and I'd speak and I would see people in airports eating stuff out of plastic and it, it didn't have any nutrients I was aware of and sodas. So I had to go to dictionary.com to look up the definition of food and to be food, you have to have value for health and it has to have nutritional content. So people are actually consuming stuff that doesn't meet the definition of food and that's what's evil. You know, pollution air pollution is so harmful and evil and water pollution and you know all of the toxicants that we're bathed in all day long that's what people should be afraid of people are afraid of the wrong things right they're afraid of their own bioidentical hormones <laughs> that is not what you should be afraid of guys <laughs> there's a lot out there you know climate change and look what's happening right now in so many areas of the world where we have all these climate refugees. We're just afraid of the wrong thing. So my goal is to just make sure people understand what is the enemy and not to, um, you know, put, um, you know, evil, you know, labels on things that are actually there to help you to stay healthy. Yeah. And you do a good job at that. And let's talk a little bit more about hormones and your specialty is, is female hormones, female women's health. Mm -hmm. There's over 600 hormones in the human body. You talk a lot. And counting. And counting, right? right? There's at you least know. 600. I know. Sometimes it's hard to know where a peptide leaves off and a hormone <laughs> begins. Right? right. So at least 600, <laughs> probably a lot more. And um, you talk a lot about estrogen. You mentioned it a little while ago. Why, do you, why is that one of your main focuses? Well, because it's like, um, well, it's like if you're going to have a play and you have the star, you know, I'm sorry, there are people in the ensemble in, in a play, and then there is, you know, the star. And so estrogen is the star, and there are a lot of other hormones that are very, very important, because you look, you can't have a great production on Broadway if you lose your ensemble, right? You can't just have the lead actor or actress, but estrogen is the lead player in a woman's body. Estrogen is the amazing link between reproductive functions and metabolic functions. Estrogen is what puts together the whole woman as a whole so that she can accomplish, if she wants, remember we're the only, the only species on this planet that tries to control our reproductive destiny and our reproductive functions. But whether we want to admit this or not, I'm very honest about it, women's bodies were evolved for reproductive success. And that's really what all living creatures are about. Reproduction, it's, I know it's a cliche, but it's a circle of life, right? You have a baby, you raise the baby, the baby has babies and life goes on and that's the circle of life. So if you think about it, would nature evolve so that a woman could be reproductively successful in terms of ovulating and implanting the embryo while she's incredibly unhealthy? And so that she would die while she's pregnant or she couldn't take care of the baby and raise the baby and nurse the baby? Of course not. So nature made it so that everything links together for success of reproduction. So you have to have not just a, you know, a uterus that can hold an implanted embryo. You need an entire metabolic system of the body to actually support the complex um, events that occur during a pregnancy and during breastfeeding. And women have many years that they have to raise a child. We have long adolescences in, in our human species, right? So it takes a long time before 
sexual maturity occurs and then the offspring can then have their own children and raise them successfully. So you need a woman to live a long time. Plus in humans, we have to have many occasions of having babies. We can't just have one or two, especially if you're going to have you know, some mortality. So a woman has to live long enough, be healthy enough to have multiple pregnancies and be healthy to raise all those children until they reach sexual maturity. So that means a woman's body has to be really strong and really healthy, and estrogen is what links all of that together so that you have metabolic health and reproductive health because it's all one. And so metabolic health is really the creation, distribution of energy. And a lot of people don't realize that estrogen is key to everything that has to do with energy, our appetites, how our adipose tissue works, the burning of fat, the transport of glucose, the mitochondrial function, all of these are estrogen controlled. And our immune systems, those amazing systems of the body that protect us from invading organisms like bacteria, viruses, parasites, but also act as communicators, right? And the immune system we're now understanding is about so much, how the immune system communicates between the gut and the brain and all, and every immune cell in the body has estrogen receptors. In fact, every organ in the body has estrogen receptors. So estrogen links everything. When you lose estrogen, it's like you're losing the foundation. And then you have the ensemble, they're still there, but they're like fending for themselves because the star is missing off the stage. So I try to make it clear that estrogen is an amazing hormone. It's incredible. And we have only actually in the last like 25 years really even come to understand its receptors and its functions. So you can't blame people, scientists or doctors for not understanding things back like when birth control pills were invented, whatever it was, 70 years ago. We didn't know what estrogen did in the body. We had no clue except that it had to do with reproductive functions. We didn't know how it linked every function, every metabolic function in the body to reproduction for successful reproduction. But now that we know it, we need to actually acknowledge it. And nothing, nothing can be too big to fail when it's actually creating long-term harm. Sometimes you have to say, let's go back to the drawing board. You know, not that we abandon the concept that we can control our reproductive destiny, but we do have to acknowledge that reproductive functions and all of metabolic functions, which is essentially the health of the entire female body, that they're all linked. So you can't just lop off reproductive functions and say, we're just going to poison the reproductive system, but the rest of it's going to go along humming fine. That's not what's happening. So women are paying a big price for being put on birth control pills, and I call them similars, things that have chemical pretend hormones, really they're endocrine disruptors, and that we're putting them in girls' bodies like when they're even 12 years old. Like they've had one or two menstrual cycles, they were painful, and they're immediately put on birth control pills and they stay on them until they wanna have kids maybe in their 30s. So their entire reproductive lives, the, be like the peak of their reproductive lives were spent without having real hormones. And these hormones are not just about reproduction, they're about making strong bones and ligaments and tendons and developing brains and bladders and vascular system and hearts. And all of these things are linked to having estrogen, progesterone, and not just having them, but having them in the perfect rhythm and the, the amounts. And we're losing all of that in all these young women because they're being put on these chemical endocrine disruptors and have no rhythms and have no real hormones for their, the bulk of their reproductive lives. And we have to be honest about this. And then we have to come up with other ways so that women you know, don't have to have babies when they're not ready. We need to realize the consequences, short-term and long-term, of, of putting these chemicals into females' bodies. And I'm seeing a lot of the results. I'm seeing women who've had repetitive urinary tract infections, and they've been on antibiotic course after antibiotic course because they don't have proper vaginal microbiomes. Their vaginas are not healthy because they don't have real hormones. They're on these 
birth control pills and their bladders are not healthy and they also have small bladder capacities. And they've shown that women who go on birth control pills before they're like 19 are more likely to have small bladder capacities so that they, they have what I call bathroom mapping. Wherever they go, they're looking for the bathroom because they always have to go because their bladders lost that stretchiness because elastin and collagen is all dependent on having estrogen. That's why as we age, um, we often will rip and tear where we used to flex and bend. And women, for example, have significantly higher rates, not just of osteoporosis, which people know, but also osteoarthritis. And these all link to increased risk for cardiovascular disease because it's all about inflammation. So, and if we don't have normal hormones, we, we know that women, we have to go through menopause. There's you know, no escape. There, we can maybe postpone it by eating more vegetables and having a great healthy lifestyle, but it's inevitable. So every woman is gonna to have to face that. So being healthy at the time that they're going through menopause is going to dictate the quality of the rest of their lives. So now we have women who've not had proper hormones for their whole lives, often terrible nutrition, right? They've been leading circadian dysfunction lives, you know, staying up late at night, eating late at night, doing so many things that are wrong. And then they hit menopause and they have no reserve. And so they're much more likely to develop very rapid onset of osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, depression, anxiety, sleep problems, and all the other things that are associated with aging, but are really estrogen deficiency syndromes. So, and then now I'm seeing these things in young girls. I'm thinking young girls like meaning like they're 28 and 30. And uh, that, you know, dates me because to me, they're very young. <laughs> and, you know, they go to like a Zoom class, right? They're just going to class, you know, like, and they're dancing and they're going like this, you know, with their arms, they're just doing, having fun. And their shoulders are ripping. Their, sh their ligaments are tearing. They, the connections of the cartilage to the bone, the labrum are ripping off. The same thing's happening in their hips. They're getting hip pain and back pain and neck pain. And they're like 30 years old, but they went on birth control pills when they were 14 and they've been on them all these years. And so they haven't developed proper connective tissue, you know, the cartilage and the, the, that's, and the bones, nothing is right. And these are like, we talked about hormones. Bone is an endocrine organ. Bone makes a hormone called osteocalcin, which helps regulate glucose metabolism and is also involved in cognition. So not having healthy bones is going to increase your risk of diabetes. People don't realize the connection and cognitive loss and osteoporosis is related to increased risk for heart attacks and strokes. So it's everything is linked, it's one body. So we have to recognize the menstrual cycle is a vital sign of female well-being during the reproductive years. If a young woman has a messed up menstrual cycle, it's irregular, it's very painful, it's heavy, that's a sign there's something wrong with her, that's a red flag. So don't try to cover it up with a pill, try to fix the problem, right? That's what we do in functional and integrative medicine. We say, what's the root cause of the problem? Maybe she has magnesium deficiency. She probably has every kind of deficiency, right? For every kind of antioxidant. Maybe she doesn't eat proper um, protein. You know, I don't know what she's doing, but she's, she's inflamed. So the menstrual cycle is a sign of overall female health. When it's abnormal, it means she's unhealthy. There's some problem there. So let's get to the root cause because when you cover it up with a birth control pill, I can guarantee you it's like kicking the can down the road. It's like covering up the wall full of mold with wallpaper. You're going to pay the piper someday because you're just covering the problem. There's problems that are going on in that female's body. And that's my mission is to help women coming in with all of these array of problems. Now, chronic vaginitis, chronic pelvic pain, bladder problems, interstitial cystitis, polycystic ovary syndrome, endometriosis, um, all these mood swing problems and everything that they're having. And then they were put on birth control pills typically when they were a young teen. Um, I'm so excited when I see young teens before they've been put on birth control pills. And I'm having amazing success in helping young women to have regular cycles, normal cycles. The thing is that we have so many problems now that are so prominent, so common. People start to think they're normal, like allergies are normal. No, allergies are not normal. That's a sign your immune system is out of whack. You're not supposed to be reacting to your pet or to grass. That's a sign that you have a problem. And allergies 
are really a serious anomaly with the immune system because of something that went wrong. Usually it's related to the gut, like everything, right? And then you, you, know, you have all these other issues and it's like, let's get to the root cause. Like obesity is now the majority of people are overweight. That doesn't make it okay. That, and the fact that young women have so many menstrual problems doesn't mean we evolved to have horrible menstrual cramps. That is a mo just like acne. Primitive societies, ancient peoples, they didn't have acne. That's another disease of modern society. So we need to realize that there are so many things that we're doing wrong and that there are things that are out of our control, but there are things that are in our control. And I want to recognize the things that are in our control, and then we can harness their own internal mechanisms to heal. And I can get almost every young woman to have regular periods, not terribly cramping and not heavy. And oh, it's amazing what you can do when you get to people earlier. Of course, earlier is better. It's so much harder when I get someone who's 45 and was put on birth control pills at 14. And she's been on them and now she's 45 and she just decided she didn't want to have kids. And she's essentially, essentially spent almost all her life on birth control pills and never had hormones. That's a hard thing to fix, but we can still do a lot of good. So I know that's a lot of information, but you know, I have to get the message out to everyone who's willing to listen. Yeah, I love it. It's, it's so true. That happened to my girlfriend. She was put on birth control uh, pills when she was a teenager. I met her uh, about four years ago and I found out she was on it and I'm like, oh, <laughs> I educated her on it and she made the decision to get off of it. Uh, and now we've been rebuilding her hormones back because like you said, it yeah. creates a lot of problems and you're right. The message needs to get out there. So I'm glad that you shared all that. Now well, we're other, I'm just going to just yeah. interject one thing that's really funny that relates to that. Well, we humans make pheromones. You know, those are the little chemical um, scents that we don't really know about, but they're actually there and they actually attract people one to the other. When women are on birth control pills, they don't perceive nor emit pheromones normally. So they're saying that a lot of people get mismatched because they're on birth control pills and they, they don't have the normal mechanisms that are actually innate into our bodies to help us get the right the right mate it's sort of an interesting other side issue yeah i heard of uh i i believe it was dr jolene brighton talking about that it's so interesting about the pheromones yeah they, they change when you go off and when you go on the birth control mm -hmm. pill yeah. so fascinating um we are winding down we have about less than eight minutes to go and i wanted oh. to to yeah this has been a lot of fun but i wanted to make sure i got to a few questions here we, there's a lot of tools in the health toolbox. There's, there's keto the right way. Mm -hmm. There's fasting, there's sleep. There's a lot of things that you already mentioned. If you had to choose three things out of the health toolbox, what are those three things and how could the listeners and viewer, viewers apply it today? Okay. So three things would be to eat real food and make sure you get healthy fats because now we know, um, and we can talk about this another time, this what's called the now endocannabidome. So it's the entire new world, newly discovered world of lipid signaling agents. And they build off of omega-6 and omega-3. And we absolutely must have them in order for our bodies to function properly. We used to always focus on peptides. And now we realize that, of course, they're very important, but we also have lipid mediators. So I would say eat real food, get rid of all the processed food, all the junk food, all the chemicals in food, and eat real food. The next thing would be to eat according to our circadian rhythm, which means that we are most insulin sensitive in the first half of the day. So I recommend trying to have a big breakfast and stop snacking and stop eating early enough in the evening so that you get at least by seven, at least most nights. So you get a 13 hour fast and you can do longer than that, but that's sort of like the, the critical amount of time. And after that, it's less return on investment. It's still fine, but you really want to get 13 hours or more if you want from dinner to breakfast, not like late night snack to afternoon snack or afternoon meal. So like dinner to breakfast, you want to get 13 hours. So you stop snacking and you have breakfast. If you eat real food and you eat with time, what we call time restricted eating, that is amazing. That is so amazing for the body. And that would be like where you would start. And the next would be sleep because people are so sleep deprived now. 
if people can get adequate sleep, because we now know that we are like two different creatures, day creatures and night creatures. And the metabolic functions are very different between day and night. And night is not just like you're, you're out. You know, you're actually rejuvenating the body. The immune system is different. Blood flow to the brain is peaking. And you need that peaking brain blood flow. And everything is different. And you're, that's when you're going into a ketosis, ketotic state. And you're burning fat at night, which is really, really important. So that's why, you know, middle of the night snacking, never, never again. So if you could just focus on three things, it would be eat real food with lots of healthy fats, no junk foods, and then time-restricted eating, eating according to our innate circadian rhythms, and then getting adequate sleep at the right time, you know, in dark, you know, with all the proper sleep hygiene that goes along with it, like dark and cool and quiet and calm and comfortable, all that type of thing. Awesome. Great tips right there and great takeaway. They could be applied immediately and they could take action with that mm-hmm. immediately. So I love tips like that. Final question for you is what is your definition of perfect health? Oh, very challenging. So perfect health would be when you're happy in your life, you have relationships that are meaningful, you have purpose in your life, you live without pain, and you have high amounts of vitality and energy. It's beautiful. I love that definition. Dr. Gersh, you are, uh, as I said in the beginning, a trailblazer. You have been doing amazing work for what, how, 25 plus years? More. More. <laughs> we'll, just for, leave it at we'll leave it at that. You've been doing amazing work for quite some time. And uh, I really admire your enthusiasm and joy as if this is just your first year doing this. And it's not. And I really enjoyed this conversation. You are somebody who saw the truth and took action and leaned into it and didn't turn a blind eye away from that. And you are helping so many people, myself included, and the keto campers. I want to thank you for your time and your energy and your expertise. I really had a great time hearing you talk today. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. And we'll do this soon. So where can my listeners go find more of your work? Well, as I mentioned, I have a brick and mortar practice. I'm located in Irvine, California. That's in Orange County, California. I see patients all day long. My website for my practice is integrativemgi.com. And I'm getting more um, robust on Instagram, and that is dr. Period Felice Gersh. So that's Dr. Dr. Period Felice Gersh. And I want to let everyone know that I have two books out now that you can purchase on Amazon. My first, which is PCOS SOS, and that's the foundation book for polycystic ovary syndrome. But honestly, it's all about lifestyle, and anybody would benefit from reading it. And that became an Amazon number one bestseller. And my newest book, which just came out beginning of January 2020, is sort of a a derivative. It's PCOS SOS Fertility Fast Track. And it's a detailed 12-week program, week by week, detailing how every woman, particularly women with PCOS, can optimize their health to improve their fertility lower their chances of having a complicated pregnancy and increase their probability of having a healthy baby. Beautiful. So important. We're going to put all of those links and resources in the notes of the podcast. Go check it out. And again, Dr. Gersh, I had an amazing time. Thank you. Thanks.